behind writing and Obviously, if, it, if we uh, only have a single server, we have a single point of failure. 
the, that signal server is, for example, Google can just be shut off and nobody will be able to see it. So what's the reason that we need a transfer there? Is we will come to that. <laughs> we are working. We first need to solve this single point of failure because if it is a single point, someone will go there and tap the server and get their hands on the server. Or if it's a <coughs> target for for actually getting root access or getting access to that server. Because if all of the communication is going over that single server, yes, that's not good. That's why we build <coughs> the federation of servers. So similar to the email system, uh, we actually have multiple servers and those servers communicate via each other, also via an encrypted link. So <coughs> now Ellis sends the message to her server and her server sends it to Bob's server and that Bob's server sends it to Bob on port link. And then, yeah, the question is, well, it's, we actually want to have another <coughs> set of cryptographic primitives which allow me, which allow Alice to encrypt the message for Bob, so Alice is sure that only Bob can read that message. And end-to-end -end encryption is, um, in the instant messaging scene, um, there's uh, one, of the, one of the newer protocols, which is also more than 10 years old, is off-the-record encryption, which is uh, online key exchange, so it requires Alice and Bob to be online. So, it's a PP class. Yes, yes. Briefly seen that. a very simplistic user interface where you have some sort of body list where that body is uh, yourself and the other body is another body. <coughs> then you have <coughs> here some OTR messages. OTR is this off the record encryption protocol. So that already got um, started here. And also <coughs> actually the first slide here is that um, the client wasn't able to send a message in the clear text because it doesn't allow to send messages in the clear text. Also, you can see here in the log <coughs> that it used the TLS uh, session, so it used a secure session to the server, which uh, you can see here. Oh, how many characters, how many columns did I write? There's just no 
functionality for that. So also in uh, <coughs> OCaml, there are actually libraries for XMPP, which is an XML-based, uh, well, which is an XML stream doing that um, messaging protocol. So XMPP is a XML messaging protocol. I'm talking here about. <coughs> then XML, and we also have some HDIP. Uh, two years ago, I started together with a friend to develop a TLS implementation I will talk about later. And this TLS implementation is also used here. There's a terminal library written by my friend with whom I also wrote the TLS library called NoTUI. And it is actually uh, very nice to work with. Previously, I used a different one, and that different one wasn't that nice. But it's also <coughs> purely written in OCaml, so there are two functions in C, I think, to handle the liquidity, which is the uh, resized event of the terminal window, or resized event of the terminal. Um, so, <coughs> what was only missing? Well, end to end encryption, OCR, well, and the human. And luckily, um, <coughs> when I started that project, uh, the TLS stack was already working. So thought, yeah, it can't be that hard to implement another triple protocol, which is much simpler than <coughs> What I mean with functional programming, because this conference is all about functional programming, I think there is no clear definition of functional programming, especially if you have then <coughs> rich or big languages like OCaml, where <coughs> already the name has some sort of O, which is object. And to be clear, I don't write much in OCaml, it's rather camel code. And it is basically the intersection between Haskell and OCaml, or Haskell and Camel. They can <coughs> code in a purely functional way, which means you have immutable data, I don't use any immutable data. I have um, explicit error handling, so I use uh, monadic and error monads basically inside OCaml. I don't use any exceptions inside of uh, OCaml because I think a library which provides an interface with exceptions is just insane. <coughs> because you expect the client to handle whatever is wrong. The only valid exception I can agree with is out of memory. And you know, well, hard to handle that. Um, <coughs> so over the years I also learned that actually functional programming should be about the containment of side effects. I mean, deal with it. We have side effects. We want to have side effects because otherwise it's very, very, very boring to do computation. And side effects, I mean, the input output of terminal, of network, of whatever, and also mutable state. But mutable state, yeah, well, better avoid it. <coughs> I think what is also really, really important is this explicit flow of data that the behavior of a function depends only on the arguments it gets. And the return value is the only value it can communicate back. There's no <coughs> side channel, not a bit flip somewhere in memory, and then it behaves differently, or it modifies some of the in memory. Yeah, that's what I <coughs> do in OCaml, and I use it both mainly for memory safety and type safety, and I've used memory safety for over 10 years, I think, when I first met Mike, still programming some Dylan code in Cambridge. But nowadays I'm a fan of type safety. I like uh, type safety. Also, OCaml has a module system which is pretty unique and other languages don't have. So what are modules for? Modules are <coughs> basically independent of other modules. And the module can take any number of modules as parameters. And you use, when you implement a module, you use the signatures of other modules, but not their implementation. Which means, I don't care if your storage is a hash table, or a map, or persistent to disk, or just a list, or whatever. <coughs> I just want to have an interface where I can initialize some storage, and I can load some key and get some data, and I can store some key and data and get data in. Or, actually, here I would to have uh, some mona because storing can also fail. Maybe the load should be an option, should be an option. But really the, the module system lets you <coughs> plug or, or contain several
several different things and provide several different implementations for that. So in the, in the operating system we are building, then we have one module which wraps the Unix Socket API as a TCP IP spec. And then we have the very same interface which just implements in OCaml the TCP IP spec. And me as a developer, I don't need to decide which one to use only at the application or at the configuration level, at some point I need to plug in the module, but it, the, the interface is exactly the same. It doesn't matter for, for other library authors which one to use. Um, the ultimate design issue which I'm iterating over trying to solve it is that I have two inputs in the XMPP client, which is the terminal input from a user then the network input from the network. And both should modify or use some shared state. And I would like them to <coughs> do that in a, on a sequential base. So I don't want to have uh, concurrent editing or concurrent modification of the state, of, the, of that state. So whenever I press a key <coughs> and there is some message incoming from the network, I want them to behave in some sensible sequential way. And this is a, yeah, the, the basic issue I had when developing this application. And uh, since, well, I started with uh, some functional reactive programming and I tried to, to do it in that way, in that style, but that turned out a bit too complex uh, for me at least. So nowadays I'm back to um, airline style mailbox. <coughs> So I have multiple tasks. This is my main task. <coughs> the main task is render the terminal, render the state onto the terminal. And then just wait until there's something incoming. And if there is uh, some action required, then I process it in here. But the process is <coughs> from state to state. So the action is actually a state in state and some side of action. And after I process that action, I just uh, render the new state. So that is as simple as that. But that is only rendering of something. So let's uh, <coughs> deal with uh, some user input. Well, the user input is uh, luckily very easy. I just wait for user input. And if there is user input, I just uh, send the <coughs> state modification function into the mailbox. And then the main task will deal with that. Modify that. Yeah, the waiting for key for the next key will just wait for the next key. Then I also have some network input, which is I wait for network input, I pass the XML, I might send also some state updates here into the mailbox, and then I uh, just look again, wait for more network input, pass more XML. There's actually some more stuff happening. I want to have some <coughs> consistency of data, um, mainly information about public keys of other users. I want to save them permanently on this. And how often I established sessions with them in order to get some sort of trust model to detect if someone comes to me with a different public key. So that one, this uh, process action now also can actually send uh, another inbox, another mailbox variable <coughs> or another piece of state uh, to another mailbox. And that one just uh, stores it on disk. And once stored on disk, it just waits for more data. So that is disk up too. Very cool. And if you <coughs> actually think about that, this whole, I mean, this mailbox actor style concurrency like airline does it as well. It's just so super easy. Once you have uh, set up your tasks and you know where to handle what, you don't have to think about it much more. Then also, yeah, notifications. People want to be notified <coughs> whenever there is an incoming message because they want to have some pop-up somewhere in their window manager or some bell, some terminal bell which rings. Um, and that is also very uh, simple. So the process thingy here 
can also put some data into a mailbox, <coughs> which does, does the notifier. The notifier is just an extract of some shell script or some program on your Unix system. Um, then we have to deal with a bit more stuff because we actually have some uh, network failures. So sometimes the network just goes down, like in Germany, where you're disconnected every 24 hours. It just goes down and obviously the client should behave well and detect that, oh, I'm out of network, I should try to reconnect to the server because I want to stay online and I don't want to fuss with the user, or the user shouldn't, shouldn't need to fuss with the, with the application for that. <coughs> so that is basically a wait for error and how a wait for error is uh, implemented is that it uh, just catches all of the um, problems inside of here, inside of the waiting for network, and sending out data to the network. <coughs> and once uh, there's a network error, it will just reconnect, which will put put back some, some data in here. And here it will then wait for the next error. There is uh, what I basically wanted to say about the global design of that slide. I have actually two instances running here, <coughs> which can communicate to each other, which is very nice. So here I can now say, hey, and then on the other <coughs> end I receive the hey. questions about that global, more global design, I'm happy to take them. So if you have a recent data, you're right. Sorry? If you're writing data at the bottom, uh, I don't see where you read the data. Yeah, that is some startup which is done over here. <laughs> that is not complete, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I read it actually at startup and then never again. Do you use some existing so there's um, so the OCaml ecosystem is a bit strange. I'm pretty new to that OCaml ecosystem, and there's uh, one task library which is called LWT, which is pretty okay, and it provides me with uh, mailbox, and I use that interface. It has a monadic <coughs> read and write on the computer network. There's another library from Drain Street called Core, which also seems to solve some of the issues, but Core is a bit too complex. Too big. Pretty big. Do you have any communication supervisors? In Netherlands, you can have supervisors that in case you get like a network failure. Yeah, you don't really have them, so this is basically a <coughs> poor implementation of supervisors on top of <laughs> LWT and what I'm not quite. Okay, now for something completely different. Um, so, an XMPP client. I mean, that is <coughs> a decent application that nearly everybody has, has it in their own language <coughs> here and there. But what I'm actually targeting, or what I'm trying to address here and in my <coughs> time I'm around is that this is how operating systems were developed, which are run on this laptop as of, as of now, which are running on this uh, mobile phone. Most likely all of your computers. So <coughs> I think, or I claim that the operating systems from the 70s like in it, are still around and are still on your desktop. And there's a huge amount of abstraction, layers of abstraction, which is not decent for nowadays computers. I mean, you don't need that. And I think that the whole system is wrong how you build those operating systems. I think it's just the wrong approach to always target this Linux or Unix or BSD or Mac OS X and whatever. 
I think we should uh, rethink operating system from crash from the scratch. I mean, just imagine we have nothing. We have maybe hardware, and now let's get started. What do we need on top of that hardware? Well, luckily we already have some technology which is called hypervisors, which provide you with isolation and scheduling of virtual machines, as so and abstracts you from hardware. So you don't need to deal with each uh, specific pieces and bits of hardware anymore. <coughs> but you can abstract a bit. And hypervisors, well, <coughs> they used to be only two or three around, but nowadays um, Mac OS X has developed X-Hive, then FreeBSD has their B-Hive, OpenBSD has their own hypervisor, and so on. So it's getting very popular. And I find that if we have a hypervisor which already does the isolation, isolation of memory and scheduling of virtual machines, we don't need to have that in the operating system anymore. So an operating system has some processes and information about processes and try to separate those uh, the memory regions which uh, processes have access to from each other. It also schedules processes which we already have in the hypervisor. So why, why do we need this whole operating system thing? <coughs> um, well, I don't know. I mean, we have a hardware and the hypervisor, and I pretend that um, I don't fix hardware for now, and I, I'm happy to use a hypervisor. <coughs> and nowadays, on top of that hypervisor, we have a network stack, file system, user processes, kernel threads, all running in kernel space, all running in the Linux, the Unix kernel, or FreeBSD kernel, or whatever. And on top of that, we have the language runtime, so the programming language runtime, which is actually executed, like your Ruby interpreter or your Python interpreter. Then we have the actual application binary, which reads a lot of configuration files from wherever those files need to have the, uh, must have the right permissions uh, in order to, to, to work out or if they have uh, two lax permissions, maybe an attacker can just read them over the internet. So instead of having all of those layers, <coughs> we are developing Mirage OS, which is an operating system written entirely in OCaml. And we just target the hypervisor. So on top of the hypervisor, we have a Mirage runtime, which is an OCaml runtime, which is, yeah, written in C, but compiled to some <coughs> some assembly code you can execute here, <coughs> and then the application code, and the application code is just a stack of libraries. But there's no need for having user processes here and so on. We just can spawn <coughs> for every for everything we need to run, we, we just spawn a, a separate virtual machine, and then we get isolation from the hypervisor for free. And the <coughs> text surface, so the, the lines of code which is executed here on the right hand side, is so much smaller. So my numbers, will, which I will show later, are maybe 4% of the um, of a similar system which behaves the same in, in that code. So Mirage OS is not a general purpose operating system, but it's a single purpose operating system. It was written from the ground up in OCaml. It doesn't include Ellipse. There's no C library included. Well, to be fair, we have some some bits written in C, but not a C library, not a complete uh, Ellipse. Uh, some interfacing code with the Xen or with the hypervisor is still written in C. That been developed over the last uh, seven years. In, in And Mirage is, well, I think that it is, um, that it uh, fills in a, a really good uh, market need because it's less complex. It's much easier to, to, to handle because you don't have to mess around with your file system and user permissions and whatever, whatnot. But you can simply um, develop libraries and deploy it as a Mirage uniform. You can also test and debug it on your on your real system. So you can run it on, on Unix and then <coughs> run and debug it on Unix and then deploy it uh, to, to that. This is 
basically the bit which where I wanted to talk a bit about Mirage OS and the uh, work we are doing there. Um, transport layer security <coughs> is another uh, protocol and it is a project I solved over the last two years or I implemented. <coughs> it's the most widely used uh, security protocol, like an HTTPS, you use it on a daily basis. It provides you with um, authentication of two network peers. You can actually have mutual authentication, but most of the time it is that only the, the server authenticates itself, and you authenticate via some better form where to enter some password. Um, the <coughs> authentication is using uh, certificates which are encoded in some <coughs> obscure ASM1 uh, uh, um, grammar. And there are a lot of implementations, maybe a dozen, which are used uh, widely. And OpenSSL is by far the most popular. It has uh, <coughs> been written in C since over 20 years. And it's, uh, yeah, this is <laughs> basically the, well, some um, heavy impact vulnerabilities uh, from the last two years. On mainly on TLS, so hardly was a problem in OpenSSL. Um, Ghost and Venom were also protocol implementation problems, Poodle as well. Um, so <clears throat> it seems to be hard to implement your own TLS there. But I tell you, it is not hard if you stick to the functional principles. So one of them is <coughs> um, to use immutable state and explicit uh, return. So this is part of our <coughs> state machine handler, which uses the type system to enforce state machine and vary. So, okay, we have some handle handshake which gets some state as input and some packet. So first we try to parse the packet. And parsing can fail because someone can send us malicious or bad input. So once it fails, we just return and uh, hang up on the handshake and say, oh, Sorry. But if we could parse it, we actually look whether we are in the right state for that packet. So only if we really await the client hello, if we expect the next packet to be a client hello, and we receive a client hello, we actually do something. Same with the others. So if we await the client finish and we <coughs> get a finish, then we handle and then we do some computation. And otherwise, in the default case, we also just hang up and tell the other side, hey, sorry. And the very same code written in, in OpenSSL or in C is a lot of uh, messing around with uh, some implicit data and some indices and some buffers that we manually manage. <coughs> um, authentication in TLS is using certificates, which basically consists of a name, a public key, and a validity period. The server transfers to you a chain of certificates, which it uh, thinks you might be able to verify. And then you need to have another source of the initial anchor, which is basically distributed with your client software. So your web browser has a list of 100 certificates which are good. And then your <coughs> web browser just um, checks whether the chain is good and that the last element in the chain is actually part of the trust in the set. Um, those certificates are encoded in the abstract syntax notation number one, which is used mainly in the telecommunications industries. And it is an, a grammar to describe data, so keys and values. There are various operators like you have choice, you have sequence, you have sets, you have um, implicit and explicit uh, data. <coughs> you can have optional fields and so on, and it's all key value where the key is most of the time an object ID. And you have uh, different encodings, um, so you can have basic encoding and normalized encoding. You can even have a packed encoding, so because they describe the grammar and they define the grammar, you can really <coughs> be, be low, and, and if you are low in bytes, you 
you can really compress it down to uh, uh, Unfortunately, in TLS, nobody used the uh, text and um, So this is the uh, one is in one grammar for a certificate in TLS or in E509. So you can see you have a version of a version, a serial number, a signature, some issuer, validity, a subject, a public key, and some optional extensions. So this is from the from the standard draft and uh, in the next slide, this is how we write it in Vulkan. So we use some combinators <coughs> in order to have uh, roughly the same as the standard, so that um, you can actually see the same. And it does the right thing. There have been uh, several problems in ASN1 implementations which actually <coughs> are written in low level languages where they mess up the, the parsing because they intertwine the parsing with reading some more data and so on, and with the grammar definition and what might come next. But if you use a decent uh, parser generator for ASM1, I think it is all fine. And it's a decent format which actually has some semantics. Uh, next element is our X509 validation. So that is sometimes problematic. We <coughs> stick to very small predicate, like is the time of the certificate valid? And is the host name in the certificate, does it match the real host? So we just do that as a match, and then only if all of them are true, we actually return success. Otherwise, we end up in script failure case. Cryptography, yeah, well, <coughs> we also implemented our own cryptography. Uh, the cipher and hashes are written in simple C code. Simple means it's uh, allocation free and loop free, so it's simple to understand and it is likely that you and the compiler agree both on the same semantics and the same behavior of the piece of code. The cycle mode, so all the complicated stuff we implemented in more common um, We also have some decent performance, so the handshake performance is <coughs> pretty much the same as OpenSSL, but at least the same all time. The proof of is we have the blue line here is up to 85% of the speed of open SSL, so it's not too, <coughs> too bad. So the trusted computing base of our system running on top of Mirage is against the <coughs> Linux and open SSL thing is that we are yeah, 25 times smaller by having the same behavior from the, from the outside world. To conclude, I have presented mainly JetLine, which is a standalone functional interpreting client with a small trusted computing base, a reasonable performance. And my goal is that the code is the communication between human beings and not between computers. So I don't care that we are only 85% of the speed in, inside of our TLS implementation compared to <coughs> openness and stuff, because I think it's, it's all fine. All BSD license, what I do. Um, we don't, yeah, we don't have memory safety issues and such safety issues. Um, Jackline currently doesn't run as a unit kernel, unfortunately. It uh, needs, uh, well, I need to implement a cell interpreter in order to do so because <coughs> at some point I need to communicate to the Unix system or at least to the terminal. And so far there is uh, no, no telnet service. <coughs> I recently did the steps towards getting getting it running as a unit and I wanted to have it already. I still want to have it done with a week of weekend for a channel. So that's pretty much what I have here. Because we don't believe in ourselves, we set up this uh, team 
Pinata, which is basically a, a security bounty. So this uh, Mirage is unicommon using our TLS stack and it has a private key to some Bitcoin address. And if you manage to <coughs> find a flaw in our stack, which you can exploit and read arbitrary memory or so, you can just grab the private key. And it will be observed in the blockchain. Um, but so far, <coughs> we still have some Bitcoins and actually the only changes were that people donated money to us. <laughs> so I'm still not sure. I would still laugh if there's anyone who's into crypto and auditing uh, functional programming software, security auditing. That is, if, I mean, if we can do that, I'm, I'm happy to do that. So, once again, what do you need to actually run Um, so, at the moment, the most uh, developed backend is the mm -hmm. but it, we, we also have a rump run, rump kernel backend, which is uh, modular, modularized uh, NetBSD, and I think the rump run way lets you run it on Xbox. It at least lets you run it on Beehive, which is the free BSD. And you mentioned that each process Well, whatever you want. I mean, if you're on the same host, you can use a piece of shared memory. There's an then the VChain protocol, or you can use uh, serialize and use uh, TCP IP. So there are multiple options for whatever, whatever you want to have. So your picture of the stack, what would still worry me is that Zen doesn't really work with algorithmics, right? So we're sort of decided there's still a full installation. Yes, so uh, at the moment, the, the Zen part that we use uh, Linux to provide the hardware run. Yeah. But luckily, we have also this uh, run to run approach where we okay. use NetBSD, and it can be stripped down much more than the Linux. Okay. But we <coughs> can, in theory, also run on the bare metal, but then someone needs to develop the drivers. Yeah. And uh, that'd be nice. If you are doing that, <laughs> you use that. So, so I think nowadays if you develop an operating system and you stick to develop your own device drivers, that's a huge pain and a huge amount of effort. Okay, well, So, so first of all, you, you just said it has uh, less lines of code, but I don't know if that's the right measure or the only measure of security. So first of all, the pinata doesn't prove anything about security. I mean, because maybe no one uh, tried to, to. Well, there are actually attempts. We we record the traces, and there are attempts which which were flaws in other TLS stacks. Maybe all the flaws. And there were a lot of accesses to that. But regarding security audits, I mean, I would be happy to, to take a security audit on that. But I don't know who does security audits for functional hosts. I mean, I, I used to be, or I, <coughs> I used to be a security consultant also for, for various uh, companies. And their, <coughs> their um, or what they research or what they look into is mainly C code and maybe some JavaScript. But I have barely seen anything in a functional world. And I think that the attack vectors in functional world are different. Because, I mean, <coughs> there has been security audits by the uh, Minister of Interior from France on the OCaml runtime itself. And if that provides us memory safety, I think we are very good off compared to other and then the protocol logic, well, we had some some fuzzing company which tried to just uh, fuzz in that uh, stack to try to, to find anything, but they could. 
and I don't believe in some FIPS certifications as well because I know people rent from FIPS and they don't find fault if they're there. So it should be nice to the human certifications, right? Yeah, it has FIPS certifications and the FIPS mode is actually uh, hugely unreliable and broken. The R&D is broken in the FIPS. So if you know anyone who's interested in doing a security audit, etc., I would have to talk to that. One more. Uh, so one thing in particular that keeps coming up with functional things in cryptography is um, that side channel attacks and timing based stuff and cache based stuff are hard to avoid or so people say. I have no idea. Uh, so what's your comment on that? Um, so first of all, there are various things which call themselves side channel or timing based side channels. So you have them in the RSA computation, so in the asymmetric cryptography. And there's uh, no mitigation for that, which we also implement, which is blinding, so it's multiplied with the random factor up front and multiplied with the same afterwards. And then nobody can actually get out of the side channel in your strategy, but only a garbled strategy. For AES, for example, there were <coughs> cache based uh, side channels if you use the lookup table in your implementation and the and then the processor, uh, well, by fetching, by looking at the cache of the processor, um, another program could detect uh, which cache line and which S box you fetch and could read your product. Um, the mitigation to that is to not use those hard coded S boxes and to use the ASNI instructions, which are available on modern CPUs, in order to deal with that. Then on the protocol level itself, so on TLS itself, there are timing side channels, which is uh, due to the fact that it uses first, uh, first to compute a MAC, then to pad, and then to encrypt. That is called Lucky 13. Well, three years ago, there was a research paper about Lucky 13, which actually exploited exactly <coughs> that fact. And the mitigations for that are a bit religious or a bit <laughs> It's scary. And currently, I have a, there's a student in uh, San Diego who's trying to exploit the, that timing part into in, in our TLS. And I will hopefully meet him on Monday and see what he has. So uh, I'm aware of timing side channels, and we read the literature. We read the last 20 years of course and so on, and we try to do our best, but we are not willing to implement some scary looking thing which someone mentioned that it should cope with something. And I don't think that timing side channels as in the make them encrypt, that you can prevent them or mitigate them in a general way. Because it depends very much on the concrete CPU you have. Because depending on the CPU model, the division or the multiplication takes uh, constant time or non constant time. Let's say how this one more time. We will gather in New Chicago.